I want to thank you for taking the time to join with me this evening. And I want to start tonight, if I may, a, a new series for these next few weeks. And I want to deal with a subject that um, I, I believe will help all of us to maybe understand, get a better optic as to what goes on when we experientially come to the conclusion that maybe God said no to me or that God refused to uh, give to me or um, bless me with something that I see others enjoy. And, and it seems to me sometimes experientially or we can feel experientially that um, it, it seems like, you know, it works for one but it doesn't work for others. And, and then we start to um, feel uh, condemned or we start to feel uh, different because, you know, other people get results when we don't. But I want to explain what goes on because sometimes what we do is we end up um, blaming ourselves uh, maybe for uh, some errors that aren't necessarily correct uh, or blaming God for errors that aren't necessarily correct. But there is something that's going on and, and I want us to, to maybe delve into it and have a look at it. Um, and I want to deal with the subject of the the heart, the human heart. I'm not talking about the, the your physical heart. I'm talking about your inner spirit, your inner being, um, and uh, because this is a very important area for all human beings, and a lot of people don't fully understand what's going on in there or what goes on there, and uh, I want us to look at that because it's a very very important subject. And I hope that the optic that we get over the next few weeks will help us to not alone understand what goes on in the human heart, but what we got to do on our part to allow God and God's word to produce in our life and the way God designed the human heart and the word of God to operate. So, um, you know, in the almost 40 years, uh, 35 odd years of ministry, um, there's some lessons you learn that that um, that are very powerful, um, that enable and and qualify you through experience to apply certain truths to your life. And this particular subject is something that um, made a big difference in my life, and mine and Lucy's life. It was a principle, a concept that we got a hold of early on, and because of it, it enabled and empowered us to see production of God's word in our life. Um, but it was something we had to grasp, something we had to understand, and I want to share that with you over the next few weeks. I normally get it hard right at the very first um, session just to get into the flow of it, but, but we're getting there. So allow me, if I may, uh, get into scripture here and talk like th about this. It says in 2 Corinthians in chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, For all the promises of God, in him, or in Christ Jesus, in him, uh, so all the promises of God, in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Well, what he's saying is that all the promises, not some of the promises, or an occasional promise, or this promise, or that promise, it says all of the promises of God in him, or in Christ Jesus, are yes. It's something we need to understand, something we need to grasp, something we need to to hang and cling to that God's not saying no. God's not saying no to us. Um, all the promises of God, when it comes to God's goodness and mercy and grace and provision and abundance and resource, God's not holding anything back from us. All the promises of God in Christ are yes and in him amen, on to the glory of God by us. Or in the New International Version, it says the same thing, same verse, but it just says it a little bit different. It says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Or what it basically says is, all the promises of God in Christ are yes. Our answer to God's yes is, Amen, or let it be so. And we need to establish that. We need to grasp that. God is saying yes. But then experientially, we may not see those promises manifest 
on, on our behalf or for us. And when that starts to happen, we start to think, well, I know all the promises of God are yes, but God must have said no. Well, see, we're, we're wrong right there. We're, we're, we're convinced right there that God said no, and that's not what the scripture said. You can't have faith in something that you doubt. I, I mean, if you think that God sometimes says yes, then you're obviously going to believe that he sometimes says no. So how are you ever going to know the difference when it is a yes or a no? No, let's sort it out from the get-go. All the promises of God in Christ are yes. And our answer to God's yes is amen, let it be so. So what do we do with this experience that we have from time to time where it seems like it's not working for us? It works for others. He seemed to have said yes to others, but it seems like experientially he said no to me. Well, let's set, set the record straight right from the get-go. God didn't say no. Because the scripture said God said yes. So there's something else wrong. There's something else that maybe we're not aware of or we're not understanding of. This bringing this experience of what we think is God saying no. But we have to establish God said yes. See, it's, much, it's very easy to talk you out of something or take something from you when you're not absolutely positive. You know, an example I like to use is years ago, um, as, as a young boy, I was raised in, in, in the Catholic Church and I was an altar boy for several years. And I remember coming out of a, an early morning service one morning out, out, out the doors of the, out of the church and somebody obviously had been putting money in, in a collection plate and there was a pound, uh, probably the equivalent uh, of $10, let's say. And there was a $10 note lying on the, at the entrance of the, of the chapel. And my friend and I, we, we spotted it, we saw it, and we picked up the $10 and we looked at one another and thought, Somebody dropped this uh, or lost it. I mean, we're not, we weren't quite sure, but here we are with $10 in our hand. And so with the $10 in hand, as we stood looking at one another, trying to, to decipher what to do, a man walked from the street as he was going into the church and saw us and walked over and said, that's mine, and took it. And as he walked away with the ten dollar bill in his hand I looked at the other guy and we both knew it wasn't his he just took the ten dollars off us from us and, and and obviously he saw in us the doubt obviously he saw the wonderment in our eyes as we stood there with the ten dollars not knowing what to do with it and he saw our confusion and he walked right over and said that's mine and took it and walked away with it walked away with my ten dollars I found it and I remember thinking he he doesn't own it but having said that I wasn't sure I owned it for I, I knew it wasn't mine but nonetheless I had as much right to that at that time as he had but he took it from me because I wasn't confident that it was mine when I had it in my hand and it's very easy to do that. It's very easy when you don't have the confidence that what's being given or what you have in hand is yours for somebody to come along and take it from you or talk you, from, talk you out of it. And many times when we don't have this settled in our, in our thinking, don't have this settled in our heart, that God said yes. And that everything that was given to us through the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus, that was paid for. Jesus paid for that. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we were healed. He paid for that. And so that was bought. But that was also given to me. That's called grace. G-R-A-C-E. The acronym is God's riches at Christ's expense. But here's the thing. If I don't and I'm not convinced that God's grace through Jesus Christ is for me, then it's easy for somebody to take it from me or convince me that it's not or convince me that God says no. 
Now, if I knew that was my $10 bill and and my mum had given it to me or my dad or I got it for picking strawberries or something when I was a kid, then I, I wouldn't have let him take that. I would have said, no, excuse me, that's mine. I would have said no and I would have put it in my pocket. But my own uncertainty caused that other man to see my doubt and he quickly took advantage of my confusion and walked away with it. And we're going to find out that that's many times what the devil does to us. When we have not got this truth nailed down in us, that all the promises of God in Christ are yes. Our answer to God's provision is amen, let it be so. That's something we got to get confidence with. It says in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, past tense, already done, blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. I I'm blessed. Sometimes I don't ex experientially, we don't see that happen, and we automatically think that God's reneged or held something back or refrained from doing something for us. And obviously, that may be the experience that we go through, but that's not truly what's happening because God doesn't say no, God said yes. And he hath already done it. He's already blessed us. So if we're not experiencing it, then there's something else going on that we're not aware of. In Romans 8.32, speaking about how God gave us Jesus, as, I mean, how great a gift could God give us? It says, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him? I mean, if he's already given us Jesus, I mean, that is the greatest gift, to give his only begotten son. I mean, what more could God give us? Himself. But how much more shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So if we can acknowledge and accept that God has given us his son and we can by faith reach out and receive it and tell everybody around that that is the will of God, that is what God wants us to have, wants man to have, then, then why when it comes to other aspects of what God give us in grace through Jesus Christ do we think that God says no? You say, but experientially that's what I fear, that's what happens. And I understand that. We've got to find out what's going on and why that seems to be that way. Because it's not God holding back. It's not God saying no. In Romans 2 and verse 11, there, there's several verses in the scripture, and there's more than this, but they reiterate again and again that God is not preferentially treating one above another. It says, for there is no respect of persons with God, Romans 2.11. God doesn't show me favor and, and to the other person less or no favor. That's not the way God deals. What God does for one, God does for all. There is provision for all, for whosoever will. And so there is no respect of persons. You don't get brownie points with God. God doesn't give us anything by brownie points. He gives us everything by grace. And of course, grace is received through faith. But God gave it all when he gave Jesus. He gave it all. And he's not holding from one and giving to another. He's not preferring one above another. In Ephesians 6, 9, again, reiterating, and you masters, do the same thing on to them or on to your employees. And here's why. Forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master, he's talking about God, also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. And again, he's talking to employers about their employees saying, you've got to treat them all fairly. You've got to treat all of them the same way. You, you don't need to have preference one above another or show favor one over another um, uh, unduly he says because with your master there is no respect of persons with him now God will respond to faith or should I say our faith will respond to God's grace and but God's not holding back from any of us 
It's there for whosoever will, for all of us. 1 Peter 1, 17. And if you call upon the Father, who without respect of persons, here we go again, God does not have respect of persons. He judges according to every man's work past the time of your sojourning here in fear. And again, there's, there's others than this, but again, I just wanted you to see the scriptures tell us that, that God is not holding back from anybody. All the promises of God in Christ are yes. God having given us his son, hey, what are things in comparison to him giving us his son? And if he give us his son, surely things are a lesser gift. And so we've got to get this, this, this understanding that if, if he does it for one, then he, that, that provision is for everybody. Sometimes we look at somebody get something or acquire something or apply the word of God to their life and it works. And, and we think, well, God did that for them, but he won't do it for me. No, that's not true. God did do it for them and they acquired whatever it was from the word of God because you've got you to approach God by faith. They obviously acquired it by faith, but he's not refusing the same result from me. There's something else going on maybe with me that's making it seem experientially that God say no. In Galatians 6, 7, says, Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Or basically what he's saying is that the harvest we get is our own, is, is, is is our own product. We're producing our own outcomes. And, and if we have a different outcome or we seem to have a different outcome, then it's, it's the way we're dealing with this process of sowing and harvesting. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. God's not the one that is, is the issue. It's, it's us. We're the ones sowing and we're the ones reaping what we sow. Some of us sow successfully and some of us aren't so successfully. And so it's it's not God that, that is, is has got the issue, it's us. How are we sowing and how are how are we nurturing that because we're reaping how we sow. In Mark, the fourth chapter, Jesus tells a parable about this whole principle of sowing. And this is what I want to look at for tonight and, and into the coming weeks, uh, principles around this concept. In Mark, chapter 4, and verse 3, Jesus is teaching. He says, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell, some of the seed fell by the wayside. And the birds or the fowl of the air came and they eat it up. I mean, it was there on the wayside on the path and it was very obvious to see. It was very exposed. And the birds came and they just devoured it up. They just ate it. Some of his seed, as he was sowing, fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. Didn't have a lot to work with. Didn't have a lot to get rooted in did not have much earth and immediately it sprang up but it had no depth of earth so when the sun was up it ended up getting scorched and because it had no root or no depth it wasn't long before it withered away we all understand this makes perfect sense and some fell among thorns the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no fruit. I mean, again, you can imagine, you know, you, you throw in, in your seed or you plant your flowers and then all of these weeds or thorns or other stuff just grow up around it and, and, and after a while they, they sort of abound more than, the, than what you planted and it chokes what you planted to the point that you can't see it or it hinders it from evolving or developing. Verse 8. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit. And it sprang up and it increased, 
it brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some a hundred. And he said unto them, If you've got ears to understand what I'm just after saying, then listen to me. Now, Jesus here is, is teaching a parable. And the word parable is the Greek word parabaleo. And we get the English word para, parallel. Parallel means to, to lay down beside, like two parallel lines. One runs beside the other. Well, Jesus threw down these parabaleos. He threw down these stories. And, and there were natural stories to explain spiritual truths. He, he wanted them to understand what was going on, but the best way for them to grasp what was going on was to give them, or to lay down beside the spiritual truth, a story that would help them grasp the concept of what was going on. And so Jesus here is talking about a sower sowing seed, and he lays down this little parable of what's really going on with the seed in the ground. And he describes four types of ground, and he describes the results of it. And then he says, if you would understand what I'm trying to say, then, then listen, because it's a very important truth. Now, later on, Jesus, in the same chapter in Mark, and also in Matthew, he, he explains this parable. He then talks to his disciples, and he unravels what's going on for their understanding. So Jesus explains, verse 13, when the disciples said, you know, what was that all about? He said unto them, know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? I love this because what he's basically saying is, if you'll understand this parable, you'll understand everything I'm talking about. You'll know all parables. When you grasp this concept, this principle, when you see what I'm trying to say to you, when you see the truth of what I'm trying to explain to you, you'll now understand everything. This is the master parable. It's essential that you get this. If you get this, you'll understand what's going on. You'll understand everything that's going on spiritually and physically. You'll, 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 you'll understand the playing field. You'll understand the game. And you ever, I, I know when I try to explain soccer to Lucy um, one of the things that always confuses or used to always confuse her was the offside rule and when a player would be offside and she would want to know why he the referee blew the whistle and I said he's offside and I said what is off? and you try to explain offside and they just couldn't grasp it it's amazing when you grasp offside then it just makes a lot of sense Likewise, when you come here to America, and you learn the rules of American football. I love the sport. I think it's an incredible game, an, an incredible strategic game. And yet, when Lucy would look at it, she just sees guys just being rough up and down the field all day. Why do they? Why do they keep changing? And they're running off and running on. And see, when you understand the rules of it, my goodness, it's an awesome game to watch. Likewise, Jesus is saying, if you understand what I'm trying to tell you, you'll understand everything. You'll get the rules of the game. If you understand the rules of the game, then you'll grasp all the rest of it. So he says, know ye not this parable, how then will you know or be able to unlock all of the other parables? I also liken it to, you know, when you go to a hotel, um, and even where I'm working right now at the moment, um, we have keys that will allow me right now to access uh, all the doors in the building. Um, people call them skeletal keys. Um, and it is a master key that fits all the locks. And he's basically saying, if you understand this, this parable, you have a key that unlocks it all because you understand the rules and the strategy of the game, what's going on. And so this is the parable to do that. And then he explains this. The sower soweth the word. Now what he's, what he's trying to tell us here is this parable is all about trying to get the word of God into the heart of man. That's what he's going to talk about. Trying to get the word of God into the right ground. 
And if you can get the Word of God into the right ground, it will produce. However, not all ground is receptive to the Word of God. And so although the Word of God is being given to all, everybody gets it, everybody has access to it, that sometimes when they experience it not being productive, they automatically think God said no or God is respecting others as opposed to them, giving it to others as opposed to them. And, and we come to all sorts of conclusions because we're not convinced that God's already said, yes, you can have it. And, and when we haven't got that conviction, we start to look around and see that some get and some don't and some have a portion and some have more and, and, and we think that, you know, it's, it's, it's something God is doing and the reality of it is it's not. The sower sows the word. It's the ground that determines what's produced, not the word. The word will produce in any good ground. You put the word in the ground and it'll grow. You know, when they went into and they, they opened um, the tombs in Egypt, the pyramids and other tombs they found in the Valley of the Kings, and in one particular one they found an urn full of corn and wheat and that was buried along with one of these kings. And they took the, the urn, a huge big urn of seeds, and... Um, they, they, they wanted to study it because, I mean, they're thousands of years old seeds. And so in the urn, th those seeds had been preserved for years. But as soon as they took the seed, there was in it, and although it had been sitting there for years, and they put it in soil, immediately, automatically, the seed came to life. And it started to grow corn or, or wheat, whatever, whichever one it was. And, and of course, the, the, the people who study uh, crops and whatever were so interested in, in looking at these particular crops that were thousands of years old. But here's the thing. It sat in the jar and did nothing. But the minute you put the seed in the soil, it automatically starts to come to life. And he's going to describe here that the Word of God is seed. That's, he describes it. He says, please understand this. The Word of God is like seed. You see that book that we carry around called the Scriptures or the Bible? Those words in that book are like that seed in that, in that container. In the container, they don't produce anything. In the book... They're not producing anything. They're not designed to produce anything in the book. But the minute you put God's word, the seed, into the human heart or put it in the right ground, it automatically starts to produce. Of itself. It's just, it's an automatic. You put it in the right environment and it automatically starts to produce. He's describing here that the word of God was not meant to be in a book. The Word of God was not meant to be just carried around or as a bookend a, a, on a shelf or something to decorate your office desk. The whole purpose of the Word of God, the whole purpose of God preserving the Scripture for us is that this Scripture, because this is not an ordinary book, this is not, this is not a tale of two cities. Um, this is not some novel. This is not some, you know, story. These words are spiritual words. These words that are in, these book, in this book are principles and concepts spoken to us, given to us by God as words with the understanding, because here's how they work. When you put these words, because they're spiritual, because God is spirit, when you put these words into the human heart, because the human heart, we're made in God's image and after God's likeness, when words and God's words are spoken and they go into the heart, they automatically germinate and start to grow with the view to producing the crop, the harvest. So the sower is endeavoring to put the word in the heart, which is so important for us to understand. God 
is trying to get his word into the human heart. If he can get the word of God or the gospel into the heart of man, it will do something. It produces. That's why the Bible talks about Satan and it says, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. It's hid to them that are lost and whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them, lest the light or the seed of the glorious gospel would germinate in them. And I'm paraphrasing. The whole, the whole reason the devil is trying to preoccupy a generation with, with amusement or entertainment or things or stuff is to keep them away from this thing because God designed his word that although it's in a book, when the words of the book are planted in the human heart, in the right ground, it germinates. It becomes flesh. And the word became flesh. The word took on tangibility. They weren't words on a page. They were actually seed that when spoken and believed and they enter into the human heart, they germinate and they produce. The sower is trying to sow God's word into the human heart. You, we need to understand this. The problem is never the seed. This should not be called the parable of the seed. This should be called the parable or the parabaleo of the ground. Because, listen, if you take, if you take wheat, wheat will produce onions. I'm sorry, uh, apples. No, I'm sorry. A wheat seed will produce cucumbers. You say, no. Wheat produces wheat. Potato seeds produce potatoes. God's word produces what God's word says. Exactly as it says it. But if, it, if I planted a corn seed and something else came up, you would say, well, that wasn't a corn seed that you planted because the law says every seed produces after its own kind. It produces after its own kind. What God's word says, God's word produces. So what do we expect when we put God's word in the right environment, we expect it to produce what it says. If by experience we have some distorted version of that, broken version of that, or, or portion of that, it is not that God is, has, has dis discriminated against us by giving us a portion of it and not the full load. It's that something happened to the seed that didn't allow it to function as it should. And it's never the seed, it's always the ground. The problem is never the Word of God. The Word of God, it stands firm in the heavens. Heaven and earth, he says in Matthew 24, will pass away in verse 35, but my Word will never pass away. God's Word's good. He doesn't have to change it at all. It is what it is. It says what it says. We have an advertisement back in Europe that talks about, you know, there's a paint company and, you know, sometimes you get a shade of this or a shade of that or whatever. And, and their, their slogan for their advert is, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Well, I want you to know that God does exactly what his word said he will do. Exactly. And, and he, he, it, it's not a certain for this one and not for that one. And if there is any difference in it, it's not the seeds problem. It's a ground problem. So he said, if you understand this, you'll understand everything. The problem is never the word of God. The problem is the heart that it's sown in. Verse 15. And these are they by the wayside. Now the wayside is a path. A path is something that a lot of people walk on. The ground has been beaten down. There's a lot of traffic on it. And there's a lot of abuse to it. There's a lot of hardness to it. It's compacted. And it's very, very hard for seed to find um, a, a, something to grab onto or get into. And so it says he, here, And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, 
Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. You know, they weren't convinced. They weren't quite sure. They have a lot of opinions. They've, they, they, they're a modern people. They've got a lot of thoughts themselves. They've got a lot of opinions. They, they, they're intelligent individuals. They're rational beings. They're rational people. And they've got a lot of things maybe in their life that hardens them toward the simplicity of taking God's word and putting it into the human heart and producing it, well, I'm not so sure. And so got a lot of these questions and not so sure and maybe just like myself and the other guy when we were looking at the $10 note, the guy saw our indecision and our uncertainty and he saw that we weren't sure and he just walked over and took it from us. He took my $10. I mean, I should have put it in my pocket. Then I would have said it's mine. But he, he knew I wasn't sure. And, and, and because I wasn't sure and definitive, he just took it and walked away. Likewise, when we hear the word of God and our heart has a lot of hardnesses toward these concepts and principles, because we've got a lot of traffic in there, a lot of stuff going on. It's hard for the seed to, to get root and, and it's easy for the devil to come because we don't grasp it, we don't understand it, and he just steals it, just takes it from us because we're not convinced it was for us in the first place. So he takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And, and this is what hard ground looks like. It's very difficult to get it to grow in it because it's, it's hard to grab, get its root into something. And for a lot of us, when we approach God's word or we open our life to a lot of traffic, a lot of opinions, a lot of, you know, facts. Then we say, well, there are the facts, there are the facts. Well, I understand there are the facts, but here's another fact. You put God's word in the right conditions in the human heart and it will produce just as it says in the book. That's a fact. And if it's not producing, here's another fact. It's that the ground is the problem, not the seed. The potato seed's not the problem. The corn seed's not the problem. The wheat seed is not the problem. The apple seed is not the problem. The problem is the ground that it's in. A lot of times when we see the Word of God not producing, we think, well, it's God. It's not God, it's us. It's hard ground. And if you want anything in God's Word to grow in our heart, this is something we have to deal with. He used that illustration of the, the path, the wayside, and that's what it looks like. It's, it's, it looks like that. It's well trodden, it's hardened, there's a lot of traffic in it, a lot of traffic on it, and it's very hard for the seed to grab root. And it's very easy to be taken from us. Because we're not just convinced, there's a lot of other stuff to get through to get it into the ground. He goes on. And these are they, likewise, which are sown on stony ground who, when they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. Hey, is that the truth? Is that what God says? Absolutely. I'd love to. I want to. And, and, and they respond positively to it, and they receive it immediately. I mean, they're up for it. They want it to happen. But we're going to find out they have a problem. Because the ground that, that the word is trying to get into, this heart condition, is stony and it, it, it's not that there's not soil there but there's not a lot of depth to it. it it there's a lot of rock in the ground there's a lot of stones in the ground and to get down to soil or something with depth something for for the seed to get nutrient from and and root and grow tall it's just not there it's like this it's like trying to plant a harvest in this and you know yourself when you sow into that, it's first very hard to find for roots to find their their stability. And so they hear the word of God, but their heart is described like this. There's a lot of stuff. There's things that need to be dealt with. There's things that need to be pulled out of there because it's, it's going to hinder God's promises finding root. And it may, it may find something, but when it tries to go down with depth so that it can grow up, it just hasn't got the depth. Just too many, too many hardnesses. It's a heart issue. It's not a seed issue. It's always a heart issue. 
It's like this, you know, you get this little thing and, and you see they don't grow six foot tall because they can't get their roots down so they grow very close to the soil and they have very little influence and effect because they're being affected by the environment in which they've been planted. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a stony ground. If you ever go to Ireland and, and you, you travel around our country and you see the mountains and, and, and the, the fields and, and the meadows, you'll see a lot of stone walls or stone fences as you call them here. And all those stones actually were in that field. I mean, they didn't import them, they didn't send for them and buy them by the truckload. They went in and cleared the field. And in the clearing of the field, the stone walls that you see are actually the stones from them clearing the field so that they could produce a harvest or grow potatoes or a crop or something in it. But in order to, to get a crop, they had to clear the stones out of it so that the, the, the crop could find root and, and soil to grow in. They had to deal with it. So them stone fences you see all over Ireland, as beautiful and all as they look, that's the work of the farmers clearing the ground for the crop. And likewise, this is, this is what you get if you don't clear the ground. It's a ground issue. It's not a seed issue. It's a heart issue. It's not a word issue. He goes on to say in the yellow, and they have no root in themselves. I'll go back and read it. These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they heard the word, yes, they want it. Yes, they, they, they want the product of it, but they have no root in themselves. And so they endure for a while. Afterward, when affliction and persecution arrives for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. When he told the parable in its, in its uh, originality, right at the beginning, in a parable sense, before he explained it, he said that they, they have no root, it's shallow, and when the sun comes and they're under pressure, it scorches them and, and they perish. And here he's saying, you know what, they, they come for the word, they say, I'll take it. But because of the ground, it starts out great, but the minute they get a bit of affliction, a bit of persecution, a bit of criticism, um, a, a bit of pushback from maybe their friends or whatever, because they're leaning in a direction towards God, um, they, they, they can't stick it. They, they, it's, they, they don't have, they don't have the, the environment for it to, to develop, and they, they quit. They get offended and push back and say, no, it doesn't work, or God said no. And that's not true. He did. He said yes. Then he says in verse 18, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. So these are people that hear the word of God. And, and you know, they want it, and they hear it. I notice every one of them heard it. Every single crowd heard it. The first crowd heard it, that was the sowing part, but it went into the wayside, the hard path, the hard ground, couldn't find any root, the devil came immediately, took it away because they weren't even sure. Second crowd, they heard it, said yes, we'll have it, but as it started to grow, it was so shallow in them, as soon as they got a bit of pushback, they said, no, no, we got offended and they bailed out. Too hard. It wasn't too hard, their ground was too hard. Here's the other crowd, they hear it, Two, and in this instance, it's sown among thorns. So watch what happens. Sown among thorns, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So they sow it, but it has a lot of other things to grow up with. There's a lot of other things that are going on in the life and other things that are growing in the same soil. So instead of clearing out all of the stuff or the rubble or the junk or the unproductive stuff, we, we think we can grow what God says up with all the other stuff. And we end up with a, a crop that's in there or promises that are in there, but it's, it's caught up in all the other stuff and it never gets to produce. It never gets to, to, to do what it was meant to do. And then it says, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in. It chokes the word. It just takes away the life. It takes away all of the focus of, of growing and producing what God said. And, and it becomes unfruitful. It just fails to produce. Not because the seed doesn't produce it, 
but because the ground and all the other stuff that's in that ground choked the word out of it. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and they receive it, and they bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. He says, these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, they all heard it, and receive it. And this is a key here, receive it. Because the, the word there, receive, means to hold on to as mine. I receive it. You, you receive something when it's given to you. It's handed to you and you receive it. Now it's mine. These are people that, like the others, like the first, like the second, like the third, they heard the same word. They were in the same service and heard the same word preached, proclaimed, declared, shared. But they took it for themselves. This is mine. This is God speaking to me. This is God's provision for me. This is what Jesus has done. This is the grace of God. They all hear the word and they're going to take it and take it for themselves and prepare the ground for it because they, they want it to produce. They know how it produces and they produce some 30, 60, and some 100 fold. It's the same seed. You go to that service and you can find four people in the same service and they'll respond to the same word the same way as this parable. You say, was it the word's fault? No. Was God preferring one over another? No. One of them walked in, heard the word and said, I got nothing out of that. You're right, they didn't. That hard ground, like the wayside, like the path, a lot of, a lot of traffic in their life and they just didn't have time for it and the devil stole it before they hit the car park. Another heard the exact same word and came in and said, you know what, I love it, I want it. Jumped into it, started in it, started to do what it said to do. And you know what? It only lasted for a while and got a bit of pushback and a bit of opposition over it or, or it didn't seem to work for a week or two and they thought, nah, it doesn't work. Got no root, got no foundation in it and they bailed out and said, I, I don't need it. Then you get another crowd who run in and grab it and, and, and you know they want it and they plant it, but they have other issues as well. They, they, they want to keep it, all of this stuff going. They want to keep all these balls in the air as they juggle life. Only realize they don't realize that all the other stuff they're keeping in the air that they really don't need is choking the life out of the thing that they do need. But there are some who realize what this is and they think, I'm going to get it. And the word there, receive, is to hold or to accept, receive to oneself. Or to hold fast to. They won't let it go. They, they're determined that this is, going to, this is going to grow. They're determined to make it work. Now, the only way I have it described and received is, imagine if um, you went to, you know, um, Best Buy or Walmart or somewhere and you, you bought a 55-inch a, a television like this and you paid money for it and you bought it and you took it home and you hung it on your wall and you and your family are sitting there that evening uh, turning the TV on and you're so excited and so happy to have the, the TV in the house and you're watching you know, National Geographic or one of your favorite programs and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door and one of your kids opens the door and this individual or a couple of individuals walk in, unplug your TV, unhook it from the wall and start to walk out the door. Now you wouldn't sit on your couch and say, hey, hey, where are you going? You say, hey, pal, I'm not letting you take that. That's mine. And he says, no, no, it's ours. And you say, no, it ain't yours. I have the receipt. I paid for it. I have the documentation to show that I did. And I'm not letting you take it. And so they lay hold on it. How do you think you'd lay hold on your brand new television if somebody tried to unhook it from the wall and take it away? So you know it's yours. You paid the money or it was given to you and you have the documentation. You have the receipt. You have the guarantee. It's in your name. It's your property. It was given to you. Now you can imagine the hold you would have upon that TV as this other gentleman tried to drag it down the hall to take it out the front door. That's what the word receive it means. It means these are people that when they hear the word of God were determined 
not to let go of it. They were determined not to let the, the traffic of life, they were determined not to let the, the stones or the hard areas of their own life and their own experience negate what God was saying to them. There were people who got rid of all of the other juggling issues of life to give priority to the Word of God and its production in life. They lay hold on it and they prepared the ground for it and they brought forth a harvest. But their attitude was completely different than the others. Was it the seed's problem? No. Was the seed ineffectual in the first guy? It was ineffectual, but not because the seed was ineffectual, because the ground was wrong. Was the seed the problem in the second issue? No, it wasn't the seed, it was the ground was the problem. Was it the seed that was the problem in the third one? Absolutely not, it was the ground that was the problem. Was the seed the issue in the third one? No, it was the same seed, uh, sorry, in the fourth one, it was the same seed in the fourth one as was given to the one in the first one. It was the same seed at the same service, at the same day, in the same environment, except it went into different ground. This ground was prepared. This ground said, this is mine. This ground said, God said yes, and all the promises are yes, and my answer to God's yes is amen. This are the people that hold on to it, will not let anybody take it from them, will withstand the pressure, would, will, will withstand the, the, the offenses of life, will get rid of anything that would hinder that from being produced, will not have a whole bunch of stuff juggling in the air, but will get rid of what's necessary in the life for the purpose of producing this. And they get the harvest. So, when you look at the four people that went to the exact same event and heard the same word, and you watch them six months from then or a year from then, and you see the different productivity in their lives, was it God who preferred one over another? Was it God who said yes to one and no to another? Was the productivity of what was spoken on that faithful day back when they were all in the one place together, when that seed was being sown, what was it was it was it the the word that was spoken, the seed that was sown, that caused the differences that grew up? Absolutely not. It was never the seed. That there, that crop, that product, that that is intentional. That's what was promised. That's what the first guy was offered. It's what the second guy was offered. It's what the third guy was offered. And it's what the fourth guy produced. The first guy could have had that. And the second and the third in our analogy, in our, in our example. But they didn't get it. The last crowd did because they wanted it. They knew it was for them and they prepared the heart for it. And it works. All God's promises are yes. Our answer to God's yes is amen. It works. So here's the four types of ground. The hard ground, the shallow ground, the crowded ground, and the fruitful ground. It's the same seed. It went into all these environments of the heart and all that stopped its production was the ground it went into. And we've got to understand this, that when we read the Word of God, when we see the Word of God, when we are given the Word of God, what determines the productivity of what we're reading is not the seed that's been sown, but the heart which receives it. That's where the issue lies. God's Word designed, God's Word's designed to propagate in the human heart. That's the way it works doesn't work in the book it doesn't work in in those pages but you take those pages and the words on them and you put them into the human heart and they automatically start to work if the ground is ready for it if the ground is ready and when the bible says in hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 for the word of god is quick and powerful it means it's alive quick means it's alive it's not alive in the book per se, sitting in the pages. It's alive when it touches the soil of the human heart. Our issue is we've got to understand what's going on. And Jesus, if you understand this, you'll understand everything. We're going to find out that God's trying to get that word into the human heart because it's actually designed to propagate 
in the human heart. That's, that's what it was meant for. That's why God gave it to us. That's why God preserved it. It's a seed bag. It's a bag full of seeds and all the plans, purposes and desire of God for man is within it and he designed it in such a way that this word becomes life when it touches the ground of the human heart and when it gets into the human heart it automatically, like the, like the seeds that come out of the, 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 the Pharaoh's tomb thousands of years later, it looked like it was dormant, it looked like it did nothing but as soon as it hit the soil, boom, it, it automatically kicked in. The Word of God does the same. And it's why God preserved it this long. It's why it's been preserved from generation to generation. A tale of two cities. Treasure Island. All of these books. Hey, you read them once, you've read them. You read them twice, you know, I mean, who needs to read it a third time? Because they're just stories. They're not alive. This thing, you can hand it from one generation to the next. And my children, and my children's children, if the Lord tarries, you give them the same book and you take that word and put it in their heart, in their generation, and it will produce the exact same promises, the exact same grace will be available, the exact same grace will produce in their life as was offered to mine, as was offered to the generations that preceded me, because that book, those words, are seeds and what determines their fruitfulness is not the seed itself but the ground to which that seed is sown so what do we got to work on we got to work on the heart you can go to the best church listen to the best teacher put up the best illustration create the best environment to give you the word of god and that's what we do in our churches many times is we create the right environment to prepare you to receive the most important part of any service which is the sowing of the word of God the teaching of the principles and the concepts of God's word and God's provision of his grace through Jesus Christ for us that's what it's all about and we think that if we show up at the church that we will get everything that the preacher said by osmosis because we're there wrong wrong People prepare and work real hard and diligent preparing environments for the distribution of the seed. And the truth of the matter is, that's not what determines the harvest. What determines the harvest of that service or the productivity from that service is the heart that sat in that service and how it received the word. So a lot of times you look up there and say, well, it's his fault. for." Pre no, if he's preaching or she's preaching the word of God, they don't determine the outcome, although they must preach the word. I mean, it must be the book. It must be the promises of God. You can't distort them or, or, or pervert them in any way, shape, or form. I don't have the authority to do that. I, my authority as a minister is to sow this seed, not, not make up my own not genetically modify it. And some people in some pulpits are trying to genetically modify God's seed to suit. Think about your genetically modified seed is, it doesn't produce itself. You gotta go back to the place that genetically modified it to get more of it. And there are a lot of people genetically modifying God's word, saying this, saying that, and you know what, the harvest is shallow whatever it is that they say it'll produce. But see the word of God? Any and every generation, any and every human heart that it falls into, if the heart is prepared, it will germinate and produce. So when you all walk out of the service on a Sunday morning or whenever it is you go to church and the word has been preached and the word has been distributed and the environment has been conducive to us opening our hearts to receive it, what's still going to determine whether that produces in your life is the heart that it fell on. Did we do the work and are our hearts prepared for the Word of God? God's Word is designed to propagate in the human heart. So we're going to be over the next few weeks talking about this issue. God's Word does work. God's Word is yes. All its promises in Christ are yes. We should determine that our answer to God's yes is amen. 
And we should determine that whatever it takes, we're going to hold on to it and not let go of it. And we're going to prepare our heart to receive it. And we're going to allow that, that word to produce and propagate and manifest itself in our everyday life. That's where we're going. That's what we're going to talk about in the coming weeks on this particular subject. Talk is talking about how to cultivate the heart and get it ready for the Word of God. Because as Jesus said, if you'll understand this, you'll understand everything. God's trying to get that Word into your heart. The devil is trying to keep that Word from your heart. And our job and our part in all of this is to get our heart ready for it and understand that we have a part to play in the fruitfulness and the production of God's word in our life, not God. You say, well, God said, God said, yes, he did say. Well, God, your word says, yes, it does. Well, God, your word promised, yes, it did. Well, God, Jesus, you know, done, so. yes, he did. So that we could, yes, that's exactly right. But it didn't happen, but it wasn't the seed. It wasn't what God did. It wasn't what Jesus did. It wasn't what God said. The problem was the heart that all of that fell on. It didn't work. It didn't work because we didn't work the heart. We didn't prepare our heart for it. A lot of times we don't want to do that work. We want somebody to come in from somewhere else and put his hand on our head and, and, and pray a prayer and, and we get it. It's not the way it works. It's work. You gotta work at it. You gotta work the soil, you gotta work the ground, you gotta get the rocks out, you gotta deal with the issues, you gotta deal with the attitude, you gotta deal with the the the, the preoccupations. And clear the field and get that word into the heart and it'll produce. And you shoo away everything and anything that would try to steal it from you. You lay hold on it and you produce a fruitful harvest to the glory of God. That's what we're gonna talk about, that's what we're gonna study over the next few weeks and I hope that you'll have enough interest to understand what we were talking about and enough interest to join me uh, as we um, as we we delve into this for the next few weeks let me pray for you father I thank you Lord for just our time this evening as we talk about the human heart we talk about the germination of your word in the heart and Lord your word is true your word works but it's got to have the right environment in which to work. I pray, God, you would help us to understand our part in this production, our effort to prepare the ground for the seed. And I pray, Lord, that as we talk about this over the next few weeks, that we'll have a determination and an understanding that, yes, you want us to have all of this. Everything that's written in the book, you want us to have. You're not holding any of it back from us. And that we would be encouraged to get involved in and do the work that is necessary to produce what you promised, to produce what Jesus purchased and gave to us through his grace. So that you'd be glorified when people see it in our lives for all of the right reasons. In Jesus' name. Amen.